What's up, everybody? Hope you enjoyed that video. Once again, this is Legacy Live, and this is going to be a frequent, we're not sure how frequent, but it's going to be a frequent opportunity for us to hear from awesome musicians, to hear about their careers, to learn about their story, and for them to share what Legacy means to them. Legacy ATX is a program that's been going on for five years that works with young people between the ages of 16 to 22 via E4 Youth, and we really talk to them about what it means to have a career as a musician. So, we have a musician here tonight, as you all know, as you all have heard, and uh, Jackie, let's just get started. Are you ready? Let's get started. Okay, let's, let's, let's start with Austin. Okay? Yeah, let's. Where did you grow up, and what was that experience like? I grew up in Northwest Austin, and uh, I really loved growing up there. My mom and dad moved here in the early 80s and really vetted every neighborhood because they wanted to make sure that we were able to go to the best school, you know, whatever the best school in the city is, you know, like best public school, I mean. So we moved to Northwest Austin, and I, it was a pretty smooth experience. I mean, you know, like kids will be kids. I had a lot of siblings, you know, got in a lot of fights. But nothing, nothing too crazy. It was just a pretty solid upbringing. How, how many siblings did you have? Eight older siblings. Ooh, you was the youngest? I was the youngest. Six brothers, two sisters. Wow. And, yeah. and they were all in the house at the same time or what? Um, at, at times, yes. Wow. There were, there were stretches of time where all of us were. Like, I had to share a room with my sister for the first probably ten years of my life, I think. Okay. okay. Yeah. So did you um, did you know mostly about that area, or did you venture out into other areas in Austin? That's the crazy thing. No, I didn't. Okay, so it was just I, like that little world right there, Northwest I was Austin. Just, yeah, I was in this bubble, and my bubble was not burst until I turned eighteen and went to college. Okay. Uh, otherwise, like, yeah, I'd drive downtown to see what it was all about, but I wasn't really old enough to participate in downtown, and I wasn't playing the guitar yet, so like, I couldn't even like busk on the street or anything. I was still like a classical pianist practiced all day in the house you know okay we're gonna get into that bubble burst. we're gonna get, we're gonna that, get yeah. into that bubble bursting in a <laughs> we second will, we will, yeah. but i wanted to throw it back real quick throw it back on you real quick right. to the soul tree collective oh man all the and way back homer hill and the urban Shout music fest out. and the alicia keys jackie the alicia, the alicia keys, keys jackie. with the braids jackie with the hat the fedora hat jackie can <laughs> yeah. we throw it back there can you tell us about that yes i can tell you all about that uh my dad fooled me into auditioning for that how, how do you do that well, because he knew I would have said no if he told me where we were going. He's like, we're going to McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, hey, we're just going to go to lunch. And I'm like, okay. And then, like, also, we went to Guitar Center. He's like, hey, we need to stop at Guitar Center. And then he just mysteriously asked me if there were any keyboards that I liked. It's like, oh, you like any of these keyboards? <laughs> Shout out I that. just thought I thought we were just, like, having an afternoon where we just, like, went to the store. Turns out he was scoping out a keyboard for me to do this audition because he knew that I was the only person who played the piano who, who was auditioning like homer wow. and my dad knew each other for years decades before that catfish station days? yeah okay. mr catfish my my mr. dad catfish. would like play at that at his place and he just they knew each other for a long time um before that and so homer called him he was like hey so i know your daughter plays the piano and we're trying to put together a band and we've had no keyboards audition like if she's good, she'll just win by default. <laughs> There's no one else auditioning that plays keys. Do you think you could bring her by? Okay. And that's how it all happened. And the rest is history. Yeah, it was a really great program. We were mentored by a band called Unified Tribe. They were like this 12-piece band, and they all did like 12-part harmonies. It was insane. And they were a really great mentoring band. And it was a really huge experience for me because I'd never been in a band. Right. I'd never been out of my neighborhood, really. Wow. I just had my, like, I went to school and I went home for for 15 years in a row. And how old were you at that point? I was 16. Okay. okay. So I had, like, just just started driving. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, shout out to the, the new Soul Tree Collective leader, yeah. uh, Mr. Swift, Charles. He's doing a great job. That's actually, my, that's my when... guy out there because he is not Swift at all. He's one of the <laughs> slowest moving. <laughs> Slowest moving brothers out there. Well, he's and a I great love, teacher. He is a great, he's a great teacher. teacher. And he's I, doing great yeah. with his kids. Those kids they are amazing. They sound really good. Those young people are amazing. Yeah, so I heard them a few months ago. He's doing a really great job. He them. is. And shout out to the Texas Empowerment Academy. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Blazer and, and, and Charles. Yeah. Raising the next generation of musicians out yeah, here. Absolutely. Okay, so you were playing the piano, right? Yeah. And then you went to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you tell us a little bit about your journey in Berkeley? What was that like? 
I had all these expectations and they were not met. <laughs> at all? Yeah, at all. And then I realized that you can't really have expectations in, in life. You can kind of like maybe dream about what might happen, but that's about the heaviest you can get. Was it like fame? Were you like seeing like fame? No, like... I thought it was going to be this like community of musicians. I thought I was going to be like, hey, you know about jazz? I don't know about jazz. You think you could show me stuff? I thought there was going to be like jam sessions in the hallways and stuff. Like I thought it was going to be like this yeah. amazing like... Basically, like, like uh, X, Burning X-Men. Man. Like X-Men like, for, for like, musicians. Yeah, like an Exodus. Yeah, exactly. Like the <laughs> Academy. I thought it was going to be like this cool place where we bah, all would bah. really... No, it was like cutthroat and like people were like, they weren't, they wouldn't trust you. And then people would do like weird things. Like they'd leave you at a party because they just found another party and they never cared about you in the first place. And it's just uh. this weird environment where I never felt like I only had a few friends and I never felt like I could... It sounds very much like college except just musicians. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. I, I thought it was going to be, like, different because I thought musicians were different. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Turns out we're all humans. We're all the same. We're all the same. <laughs> we're all humans and we're all the same. Well, you learned it here, folks. We're all done. Rap. It's a rap. We're all the same. We learned everything. <laughs> Thank we... you. Good night. <laughs> so, okay. So then you graduated from there, right? Yes, I did. I okay, graduated early. Early. So you, like, put the, you put the speed up. You're like, this is whack. I'm getting out of here. This is whack, but I've already spent a lot of money here, so I got to get something out of it. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right, now let's bring it back. You're talking about your dad. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a musician. He was a career musician, right? He, he yes. played for a living. So can you tell us about his influence on you in your life as I, a musician? I directly got to see somebody run a band. Like, if, if, if nothing else, he did that. He ran a band, and he got gigs for the band, and he got opportunities for the band, and it made him full-time money. And uh, that was his job. You know, like, the parents have a job. The mom has a job. Dad has a job. That was his job. And uh, he did a great job. He was usually gigging like three times a week, sometimes four. And the hours worked out perfectly. My mom comes home. He goes out to the gig, you know. And uh, it was just amazing watching him like rehearse the band, put the band together. Sometimes I would actually go into the, they would rehearse at our house. And I would actually go into this rehearsal room and watch them work stuff out. Just every facet of running a band. I would, I would, watch, I would listen to his conversations like, yeah, 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 we'll load in at 7.30, and uh, you know, can I bring my daughter? You know, like, I would even listen to his conversations that he was having, and even though I don't remember any of the things he said, I'm, I know, like, when you're a kid, you just, like, you just absorb everything, you know? Did, I mean, did he, was he like, you're going to play music, or did you just kind of follow in his footsteps? Did he, I mean, he obviously put a keyboard in your hands, but, like, <laughs> was he, like, really? He did nudge me a little bit. He nudged you? He, he uh, around, like, 14 or 15, he started kind of telling me that it's, pretty hard to make a living playing solo classical piano and but but that I do a really good job at it and I could redirect these same skills into some, into a genre of music that more than 1% of listeners listen to. <laughs> so you he started, started just kind of like drifting me away from playing classical piano and like was like, "Hey, you want to come jam with my band?" He would like let me come in the back room with my new keyboard and jam yes. with his band. Like yes. he was like he wasn't, like, harsh about it. And the Alicia Keys braids. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and the hat. Yo, I need, I'm, I'm going to put a, po- po- a picture of this up online. They got to see My it. band was called Jackie and the Gents in, uh, in high school. Wait. I had a band in high school. After Wait. Soul Tree ended, I had, like, this void. Because, you know, it's a program. It's like a six-month yeah. program. Yeah, yeah. So I had this void. And I was like, I need a band. So I started a band in, hi- in high school of, like, just motley crew that i put together and the gents jackie and the gents was it was it a mix was it all males it was like seven dudes in the seven me seven dudes in <laughs> you dudes in oh, wait a minute i had a horn section a horn like yeah. three you had three horns? trombone saxophone trumpet yep wow guitar keys me on keys i need i need uh, some vhs tapes or it didn't happen yeah you're right vids or it didn't happen <laughs> I, I got picks you got picks i got picks i, need but to I, see I don't them. think i have any videos i, I gotta see them i gotta see them <laughs> i would love to see those um, shout out to your dad, man. Shout out to yeah. all, shout out to all the parents taking their kids to rehearsals and, and just Im- immersing them in the culture because it takes that it understanding. And I'm sure there's things that you probably fall back on that you learned that you didn't realize you learned. And then yeah. Habits. Just, just by watching. Yeah. Right? That's true. And there's also like a lot of, um, confidence that I have because I watched somebody else be confident in a similar situation. You know, it's like, I always talk about how important representation is. It's like, he, he literally just was a working musician in front of me. And that's huge. You know, humans, humans are smart and they learn fast. So if you just do things in front of them, they're going to learn 
pro- they might even learn how to do the things that you're doing. You know what I mean? Was so. there a piece of advice he gave you like before you really started? <sighs> I could write a book. Okay. I could write a book of like dadism. Okay, let's hear, a, cu- let's hear a couple of them. Jacqueline? Jacqueline. Oh, wait, hold up. That's what he calls me. Jacqueline. Now, Jacqueline, if you want to be the leader of the band, you get the gigs and you own the PA system. Okay. That's one thing. Old school. Me. That's some yep. old school tip right there. That's one thing. He's like, Jacqueline? Jacqueline. Never let your left hand know let your let never let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That's old school. Says that a lot. Yeah. And then a few times some of the best advice he ever gave me was there's like the venues, they're just buildings. Mm. He's like, they're just buildings. Mm. He's like, why why are you tripping over the fact that you haven't played in that venue yet? Mm. He's like, what you need to do is figure out how to fill that venue, and then that venue will call you. Mm. He told me he spent the first five years of his career going over club owners' heads, talent buyers' heads, because they ignored him. He's the one who taught me how to do that, how to wow. just go above them. Just be like, no, you're not going to stop me. That's awesome. <laughs> My dad really taught me that. When he came to this town, he had to claw and fight his way for his first gig. He was a jazz band, and uh, he he had to go over a lot of people's heads just to get gigs. And, and you, you have, like, a brother or two that's musicians, right? Or you, one I have one brother. Drummer, right? One brother. His one. name is uh, Andre, and he plays keys, and he plays drums, and he lives in Houston, and, and he just rules. Rules the, Houston? He rules the gospel scene, or at least is in the group of people that do rule it. He's playing everywhere, man. He's Got always it. been busy. He's, he's a phenomenal player. Did you ever play in, like, a church setting or anything of that nature? No, I never did. I just grew up in this North Austin bubble, man. <laughs> Just, it was a bubble. You just stayed right there. I just stayed yeah. right, right in my cul-de-sac. <laughs> okay. That's what's up. <laughs> yeah. this, this question is uh, kind of related to Legacy ATX. And, you know, we really stress the importance of mentorship. Yeah. And, you know, like you were talking about with your father, you, did you have other mentors in your life that, you know, kind of gave you direction and guidance that helped you along the way? Yeah, definitely my mother. She. Uh, shout out mom. Yeah, shout out mom. My mom and my dad. So my dad taught me how to operate in the music business. And then my mom just like taught me how to just be like fierce and intimidating. You look just like it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But, but also she also, she also taught me how to uh, disarm. My mom is Hmm. so good at disarming people. Like they come at her and like, she just like opens her mouth and they immediately calm down. (laughs) It's amazing. And uh, stuff like that. She's also just like a brilliant businesswoman. And I think that there's just like, just having having her brain be a part of my brain, I think is just like, I think that I see things sometimes that other people don't see and I don't realize it just because I'm a part of her. She's right. just brilliant. Wow. So my mom and my dad were like, that's why I was so in that bubble. I was like, this is all I need, man. <laughs> I'm like, my mom's cool. My dad's cool. We and got you, the band and, coming over. I'm good. And your sister Christina, you were just like <laughs> And then all my her, siblings. Right? Well, yeah, me and my sister were like, we might as well be Siamese twins. But then my other siblings also, you know, it's like I didn't need to leave the bubble. I had everything I needed. The first 18 years of my life, I That's had everything beautiful. I needed. That's yeah. beautiful. You know, you had a safe space to just learn and be curious. And incubate. Everything. Incubate. Yeah. If that's what you want to call it. Yeah, yeah incubation. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of incubation. Yeah. So, butter and jam. Oh, I can can't you, wait can to bring you, that back. I, 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 shout out to Chris uh, Edwards and Reggie Colby and Dave and, Manley and John Dees and Dave Manley yeah. from Philly, right? He's and, from Philly. Yep, and Came Swift and and all and, and, and Mario just the whole crew. and the whole yeah, crew. Yeah, Mario, the whole crew. Can you can you um, talk to us a little bit about that incubate? Like, why is that important? Like the jam thing, just jamming with the band, just just shedding, doing that type of work as a musician. Can you talk about the importance of that? The the best way I can describe it is a language. How do you learn how to speak a language without speaking it? How do you learn how to speak a language without hearing it? You know, it's like you want to learn how to play jazz. You better start listening to a lot of jazz. You know, every genre is its own like sub language. You know what I mean? And um, when you go to jams, it's like the safe space where everybody's just there to have fun. And usually it's like kind of curated. So, you know, that like no one's going to get on stage and kill the vibe. And um, it's just a really great way to just practice practice your vocabulary, talk to people, learn other people's vocabulary. Like, oh, what is that guy doing? Nice. And it's just this safe space where you're not like in this really sterile environment where it's like people are in seats and you're on the stage and you need to do a good job. You know, it's good not job. like, yeah, it's good job. We paid tickets and now we're going home. <laughs> like, it's not like this like yeah. structured thing. It's this place where people can just speak 
and be. And that's really important because that's what you need to do in order to be able to put on a good show in that structured environment. You got to be able to know how to free yourself on stage. The only way you can do that is go to jam. And a lot of your songs, I feel like, have to do with freedom. Yeah, have, definitely. Have to do <laughs> just breaking free shackles, like I'm out of here, I'm yeah. breaking out. Like, it's like, just let me be. Right. And, you know? and is, that, is that a hard thing to find, like um, just being an independent musician? It, it is, because like, there's always an issue with how are you going to put food on the table? You know, how are you going to both develop yourself and then also in, in the time that you're developing yourself, how are you going to eat? So it's like, yeah, I'm not very good right now, and I don't know how to put on a show right now, but I need time to learn how to do that. And then if I have to worry about putting food on the table, guess what? That's less time that I can learn how to do that. And it takes a lot of time to learn how to perform, to learn how to play, to learn how to sing, any of that. It takes a lot of time, and the challenge is always fighting the real world society, like staying alive in the society while also trying to develop yourself creatively from within. It That's... That is the struggle, you know, eternally. It, and it, and it, but it, it teaches you, it, 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 it builds you, it builds you up. Well, yes, it does. And right? the, the good news is the cure for the struggle is learn how to hustle, baby. Okay. If you learn how to hustle. Three tips, three tips on, on hustle, three hustling. hustle tips. Three hustling tips. Tip number one, at first, you might have to do some free work to get paid work. Talk about that. Learn the line between free work because you're developing yourself and building your repertoire Let's go. and also networking. Find the line between that and then just being taken advantage of. I, if I love you that. know that you put on a good show and you've developed yourself, that's that's when you stop doing the free work. You gotta know though. You gotta know, but you know. You, know. I, you know, I think some people get there Actually, think that they're a little early. Some people get there a little early and they don't or have they a support think they're there. They don't have a support there. system and then uh -huh. people don't tell yeah. Try to know. Just know that the line is there and be aware of it. You might you might be able to know, but yeah. Okay, that's number one. That's okay. tip number one. Okay, tip, number two. Tip number two. Uh, it's like your whole life. So you're just kind of always working. Like you're on call. You're always working. You never know when a gig's going to roll in. And if you don't really love doing it in the first place, you're not going to love that schedule. You're not going to love that your life gets interrupted by it. But I don't consider it an interruption. I love it. So like when I get called by the hustle, I'm happy to skip off and go hustle. <laughs> you know what I mean? You probably do skip too, huh? I'm like, whoop, dee, 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 dee. So tip number two, like love the hustle. Okay. It is your life. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Tip three. Tip three. Tip number three, be patient. Be patient with yourself. Um, sometimes you're going to have to do stuff that's not related. Sometimes the hustle includes dog walking or dog sitting or babysitting your sister's kids or... You know, Whatever anything you do, right? to make it so that I don't have guaranteed 50 hours gone every week. Right. I would rather have two hours of dog sitting on this day and then three hours of hosting karaoke on that day. And because the, right. then I have all the time surrounding that to develop the thing that I'm trying to develop into. Can we talk about just quickly about the transition from the piano to guitar? Definitely. And, and just how because we're talking about practice. Oh, so we're obsessive. talking about practice. I mean, you were you were. How, how did that happen and how much time did you put into that? It actually started, the root of that is the piano. For the first four years of the piano, I just kind of like, I just kind of like messed around and didn't really take it seriously. And then my brother Andre came over and started playing the piano. I found out he had only been playing for a year and he was like unbelievable. And I couldn't believe it. And then after that, like a light switch turned on. And I'm like, I'm not going to stop until I sound like that. <laughs> like... I am not going to stop. And I know what I heard. And I know what I'm playing. And this does not sound like that. So guess what? I am not done. <laughs> like, I'm, and I'm saying it like this because I'm, like, obsessed. Yeah, you, you kind of went cuckoo a little yeah, bit. Yeah, like, I am not <laughs> done. Like, I don't sound like that. Three, four years in, yeah, my yeah, mom's yeah, like, yeah. oh, the piano's so loud practicing. Sorry, not my mom. My mom was always down. My brother, the piano's so loud practicing. Why can't you practice earlier? I'm not done. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just beast. crazy. We call that beast mode. That's beast yeah. mode. You hit it, beast mode. It took, like, seven years of beast mode to get to the place where I felt like I could audition to get into a school or something, but it was seven years of beast mode. Me meanwhile, that. your brother was like a year. He was just like... <laughs> 
That's because he that's because he plays in the church and people who play in the church got that magic and you yeah. know it, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always been that way. It's, it's, it's part of that jam though. It's part of that shit. It's and the stuff spirit. That they do. It's the it's, spirit. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, it's like a different. It's a higher connection. There, yeah. There's a real reason. That's a whole other conversation. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Yeah, like they're they're playing for God. That's a that's like a higher connection. You so know? you don't you don't feel that like if you're in a club you don't feel like that connection. No, I you? feel like since since they came up playing for God, they make the connection it's sooner. Sooner. You know, okay, like it's okay. going to take somebody like me 10 years outside of the church okay. when I could have been in the church and it would only take two because it's like you're playing for God. So it's like the spirit is just like. That's fair. They just, they get there sooner. Yeah, I got you. I got <laughs> you. Because know, they're like in love, playing for love, promoting love. It's like all love. So they just win. They win? <laughs> you know what I mean? They just Thank win. You, <laughs> you win. That's why love. they're the best players on the planet. It's true. Because they just like, they're doing everything for love and. But anyways, I digress. Yeah. Um, so how many hours, like a day? So you 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 went beast mode on the piano, and so that's what taught like, me how to do the so the guitar uh, thing. Uh, I made the decision to switch to the guitar, and then I came home. When, when was that? That was March 2011, two months before I graduated Berkeley. Nine years ago. Yes, nine years ago. I came home two months after I graduated from Berkeley, and yeah, I saw players at Berkeley. Whatever. Came home to Austin, freaking Texas, man. Went on Sixth Street to a blues jam just for the heck of it. Ran into Dave freaking Cher, man. And I saw that guy playing the guitar, and I was like, ah. Is that good? Or what happened? Was that good <laughs> Dave or Dave Cher is one of the best players in Austin, Texas. Okay. So okay. I All saw right. Dave Cher playing the guitar, and I was like, I am not done. <laughs> like, I so that was, your, that was, that the was next, the switch. I, I'm not done. Yeah, I would shout out to Dave Cher. You guys turned the, obses- you turned the like guitar obsession switch on. I, I saw him at Strange Brew, shout and I was like, you. Strange Brew, man. Rest I in peace. I saw him at Strange Brew, rest in peace. And that was like the guitar obsessed switch was like. Okay. And then it was the same beast and then, mode. And then, and then you like. Just Three to six hours you, every day. Did you go to like a pawn shop, get a guitar or what? You went to Guitar Center? What happened? No, me and my dad went to Guitar Center. I thought it would be I nostalgic. Love this. I, love, <laughs> I, mean, I love it. I was you like, dad, dad, do you want, I was like, yes. you want to come buy my first guitar with yes. me? And you know what he said? What did he, he say? He was like, you're, you're switching to the guitar? He's like, didn't you just get back from college on the piano? <laughs> right. That's what he said. I was like, yeah, Dad, I'm switching to the guitar because I just have a hunch that it's going to be like the thing I can build my career on. And he was like quiet for like 15 seconds. You know when you tell your parents something and they're yeah. quiet? You're oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And he was like, get in the car. Well, if you're going to do this, you better be damn good. Like you can't just be like someone who has like a prop hanging around your body. <laughs> He's like, if you're going to play guitar in this town, you need to be great. Mm. And then he was quiet for a second, and I was like, Dad, I'm on it. I'm, like, obsessed. And he was like, okay, let's go to Guitar Center. <laughs> so after that, three, four hours a day? Three hours a day at first, and then at year three, six hours a day. And now I'm back down to three for the last two two years. It's been about three hours a day. Okay, so say that again. It was nine years, so three It was like the three first three years I played for three hours a day. Okay. And then after three years, I wasn't even halfway where I wanted to be. And so I like had this meltdown, and I like called my sister, and I was like, what have I done? I can't believe I spent my three life. years. I like meltdown. I called Christina. I'm like melt, melting down. And then after that, I like woke up the next day, and I wiped my tears. I was like, all right. And then it was like <laughs> six hours a day. All every. Right. I'm serious. I woke up the next morning like a phoenix. I was like, okay. <laughs> and, and then it was six hours a day for the for the for the following five years. Wow. And My now you're back. And now you're back to. Now I'm back to about three. Yeah, because I, I, I get tired now. And I don't know. I get tired. I mean, now. look, you're you're, you're like a, you have a a small business. Yeah, and I'm doing a lot of other stuff too, yeah. so I really can't do six anymore. But three is sufficient. I'm happy with my playing right now. Okay, so y'all, y'all heard it here. You've been on the to- what show? with Tonight Show with oh, Anderson, the Late Show. The Late Show with Anderson Pack. You, yeah, you played all type. You toured the world. Yeah, three hours a day <laughs> for three years. And I wasn't even. I was like twenty percent of the way there. Six hours a day for five years. For five years, yeah. Did y'all hear that? Okay, I just. Yeah. If you're taking notes out there, write that down. Okay. <laughs> that was crazy. Now, let's let's bring it back to today. Okay. The here and now. Here yeah. we are. Yeah. How are you? I'm doing good. It's, That's good. Okay. It's a crazy so world we live in. That's let's all Let's talk saying. about uh, Blues on the Screen. Yeah, Blues on the Screen. Let's we, talk about it. We filmed that today. Let's talk about it. So, bring people up to speed on what happened you, with, with them asking you, and just run it down real quick. A lot of people might not know, so can you just break this down for us? Bullet points. I sent out a Facebook post. 
uh, to my community in Austin. Now, before that, what happened with Blues on the Green? And, oh, no, no, no. Yeah. This is oh, the beginning oh, this is of that. Okay, so, this bullet is it. point, I sent out a Facebook post saying that, like, I'm paying attention to the talent buyers in this club. I hope you guys actually believe Black Lives Matter and that you're not just saying it, right? Two days later, I get offered a bill for Blues on the Screen with, uh, in the bill, basically, like, I'm the token. So then I clap back, and I'm like, no, not going to be on this bill. As a matter of fact, this bill is unacceptable, and this is what needs to happen. And then there was an exchange, and it was crazy. And then the paper caught wind of it, and the paper was like, amid diversity issues, Jackie Vinson walks away from Blues on the Green. And then there was this crazy hubbub for like 48 hours. And then the, the talent buyer who books Blues on the Screen uh, actually came back and apologized and then allowed me to curate it. And now I'm curating the first all-black lineup in the concert series 28-year history. How does that feel? Do you, are, you, are you proud? Are you excited? How, how, what's, your, what's your feeling on it? It's like I'm excited, and I'm happy that it went the way it went, um, but I'm just overwhelmingly aware of the fact that this is just the beginning, and uh, so I'm not, like, I'm not, I'm not breathing. I'm not, like, letting out a, like, I'm not done. We're not done. We're not even close to done. We, like, just started. And so it's like this mixture of celebration and also, like, long path ahead, but hopeful, you know? Can you, can you talk a little bit, because you kind of you glazed over, can you talk a little bit about the race implications of just being a musician here in Austin and how that connects to maybe Blues on the Green or just other opportunities, what was presented, what's not, things like that? Austin's had a long history of segregation. Austin has a, Austin has a uh, is one of the only fastest growing cities in the country that has a shrinking black population, dropped ten percent in ten years. I'm pretty sure, which is crazy, and it isn't going back up. So um, we we obviously have a race problem, and it is very reflected in previous lineups of our biggest festivals and and series si uh, concert series around the city. And it's apparent. I'm not. I'm not just like. I'm not just like throwing poop up to the fan. You know what I'm saying? It's you, you, just real. Who I'm, throws? Who throws, throws poop, poop up, up to the, to the fan? fan? Who I didn't want to cuss. What do they do that? You know, the poop hits the fan. I okay. I wasn't just like saying stuff so, to start some fight. I wasn't just firing shots. You know, like this is stuff you can research. You can look at the bills. You can look at the past bills. You can right. look at the bills for years going back. Blues right. on the Green had one black headliner in seven yeah. years. Yeah, we like, were the, we were the only hip hop group to ever play there. 20, Only hip hop group to ever play 2016. it. 2016. Bitty Bitty Banda was the first Latinx female fronted band to ever play it. Yeah, so we're crazy. not even talking about just black people. And we we're got people like Gina black... Chavez and yeah. others, all types of people. We're talking about from. a bunch of people, basically people who don't fit in this one category. Right. And here's the thing. I don't need to prove it. You can just go look it up yourself. Right. And it's, I, it's apparent. I, I got to say that like us as, uh, us as Riders Against the Storm, the only reason we got that opportunity was because I was I told Andy Lang, I was like, look, we won Band of the Year second year in a row. There's no there's no way we're not playing that stage. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He was like, I'll see what I can do. I was like, no, this is gonna happen. And that was that was twenty sixteen, y'all. So I understand the yeah, it's the real. friction and you know what I mean? And it's probably real. around twenty seventeen, myself, I just stopped caring about <laughs> doing anything really in Austin. Have, yeah. did you have that did you ever have that feeling or well I Took my I took my dad's advice and I just created my own tribe. There you and, go. And and now you know, so now a lot of these entities might need me more than I need them, and yeah. that's what my dad taught me to do. He's like, you don't ever want to be dependent on anybody. So, so um, he um, that's what that's what happened. I got to the point where it's not that I didn't care. I did care. It's disconcerting. It's really sad to watch my friends and my colleagues try to get an opportunity that I got, and, and they call me up and ask me how I got it, and I don't have the heart to tell them that I, d I just checked two boxes. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's like, no, it's your talent. No, no. Because there are a ton of other bands in this town, hundreds, that are just as talented and amazing as me. And they don't well, get the same opportunity. Well, I, I got to say, I think I think you are a select talent in this city. I got to say, I, I know, you know, but what there's I mean? a lot. There's a lot. There's a but lot Jackie, of select I, talent know, in this city. I, I got to say, I got to say, <laughs> you you are one of the best guitar players <laughs> in this city. Period. If not, you know, in the country. Oh. Um. So 
don't, you know, let's 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 I'm not gonna e- downplay it. Let's let's ease up, you know what I'm saying? That don't get me wrong, as you know, we've been on Ross Day for years and we've always been about putting yeah. that talent. So we know the talent that There's exists. There's a lot of talent but, out here, man. You know, you are in a slightly different place than most musicians, white, black, whatever in Austin. So I, I hope you know that. I hope you feel that. You well, got what seventy thousand <laughs> likes on Facebook? I mean, you are like well, that's because I went outside the state to find hey, success because I had to. Hey, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. How many yeah. uh, likes does ACL have right now? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like eighty thousand challenge. You know what I'm saying? How many likes? I'm, I'm just. I'm does just saying. ACL have? People know. People know who you are, and it's mostly just through your straight up talent and the tenacity and and what you've done with the guitar and what you've done with your music. So there's everyone some, can't say that. Everyone there's, cannot. There's say truth that. to that, but also there's. There's also people who maybe didn't have the support system that I had, that didn't have the opportunities that I had, that might be a, might be a whole lot darker than me. I'm very light skinned. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of el- variables. Absolutely. You know, it's not just talent, and and that's what I'm trying to eliminate. I'm trying to eliminate yeah. more variables. I'm trying to take away hurdles because what happens is when you hold people back, they don't have the opportunity to become select talent. Yeah. So like you said, I'm I'm in a select group. Imagine how many people didn't get the opportunity to get to that select group 100. because they didn't have the time and the opportunity 100. that I had. They didn't have the support system. They didn't, and, and that's where you know? that's where programs like Legacy ATX come in. These that, are the people I worry this about. These are the yeah. people that I'm going to always go up against the big – I'm going to always go up against people. I want to protect those people be, and right. I want to foster those people because they could grow up, become amazing, and inspire me back. Absolutely. You know, and I don't want them to get squashed before they even get the opportunity to get there. Uh, props to you for that. You know, yeah. and, and again, that's why something like E4 Youth exists. That's why something like Legacy ATX exists, because it's really reaching yeah. out to those young people that do tend to get marginalized, that do tend to get overlooked. Or ignored. Or ignored yeah. completely, yeah. right? But they have talent. And so, you know, education is really not about pouring something into a student, it's about pulling it out. Yeah, so it was that's, already there. Yeah. You know, that's what Legacy ATX is about, and that's why Beautiful. you're here. Yeah. You know, and and I hope that the young people that see this in the future or are watching now that you hear how much time and energy she's put in, regardless of the opportunities that you may have had over other people. You also put in a whole whole lot of I did, work. Yeah. So we don't want to downplay that. <laughs> yeah, um, I appreciate that. Let's talk about the hardest lessons because you know I. I'm the program director at Legacy ATX, right? Yep. So usually when I'm with the students, I'm like, don't get into music. Like, <laughs> when it gets, you know what I mean? At the end of the yeah. day, I'm like, you really don't want to do this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I know you think you do. I know you like rapping or whatever it is. <laughs> but this is hard. No, but Yeah. This is I, like I, next get, level hard. After we get past that point, you know, it's yeah. like week two or three yeah. where I like, I just, it gets real. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Then, you know, you know, I soften up. But can you tell it? I know I have my own story, but can you tell us about some of the hardest lessons, the failures, the things that just didn't work that you had to go through to get where you're at? The piano. Mm-hmm. I I grieved the fact that the piano wasn't going to be the thing for me for three years. I grieved that. Uh, I stopped playing the piano consistently around age like 19. And I only played it in order to complete homework assignments. Like I only used it to, I didn't like have like I wasn't writing songs I wasn't feeling creative it was just like this part of me just knew that I wasn't ever going to be able to carve in, in, a, in a like individual niche for myself on the piano I just had this gut feeling I, mean, I know people say never say never but sometimes you just know you just know that this isn't this isn't you and uh, I grieved that for three years because like I spent I, I did all that beast mode like for what you know, like, oh, my God. And like, what if I pick up another instrument? And also, that's not the right instrument also. And then there's two instruments that were the wrong instrument. So like it was Nervous like, a, yeah, it was like this anxiety, <laughs> like grieve for like. And all I did was just keep my head down and do my homework and try to get out of that school as soon as possible. And that was the only thing I focused on during that time period. How about I mean, we've talked about this. And you might... So that was the, that was a really hard thing for me, like accepting that I had to change myself. I, w- I want to talk about some of the, the business aspect, though, because oh, yeah. we've talked about that, because a lot of people don't understand this, you know, is a business, oh, yeah. right? The business of music. And you've, you know, you've done a lot and you've made mistakes. Can you talk about some of the mistakes that you made so that people can learn from them? some of the failures that, that taught you, brought you to where you're at? <laughs> the biggest piece of advice I can offer you is like, seriously, 
do not give any name droppers the time of day. I don't care who they are. Okay. Do not give any name droppers the time of day. That is all three red flags. All three of them. Somebody comes at you like, you should hire me because I worked with blah, 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 blah. And, you know, I heard your recordings and they're, they're okay, but, like, I can get them to sound like blah, 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 because I worked with blah, blah, blah. And they're like, I work with Bob Marley. I worked with me, 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 And they just keep on, like, they don't actually say anything <laughs> of substance and they just keep they're dropping just names. names. And here's the thing. Sometimes, sometimes they're really, like, sometimes you'll go online and research them and, and they weren't lying. They really did work with all those people. Right. But here's the thing. If they feel the need to have to name drop to you in order to get hired, what's wrong with them? You know, like what? Why are they so? Like why are they so desperate? Why do they have to sit, spend fifteen minutes telling you all the people they've worked with? Why can't right. they just be like, "Here's my card. Let's meet up. Maybe we could do something." Right. That's the kind of person you want to work with. Someone who's not like trying to like flex their ego on you in order for you to give them money. Right. You want to hire somebody who's interested in you for you. And honestly, I've met a lot of people who have worked with really big famous names and they're they're losers, man. And they're leeches. Okay. And just because they've worked with those people doesn't mean that they're worth working with. And that was one of the hardest things I've ever learned. Because like some of these people were like, "Oh, well, I ran the Super Bowl uh halftime show." And then I go look them up and they did. I'm like, Whoa, but then they end up being like, well, if you pay me $1,500, you know, I can get your stuff out there. Like, what does that even mean? What do you mean <laughs> you could get, oh, because you work the Super Time, you're the Super Bowl halftime show, I, I, I should give you $1,500 to get my stuff out there? Right. Are you serious? Right. So I'm telling you, like, those people, they always give themselves away. The first thing they do is name drop. First what about, thing. what about, like, quickly, like, what about, like, financial? Like, I know, like, you know, you sometimes you, you, you spend money on a, a, publicist you didn't need to or whatever or like, a name what, dropper or, you didn't or need a name to. drop or whatever <laughs> yeah. like what can you what what kind of tips can you give somebody like on, on like where to put their money when they're starting where to put their money kind of at the beginning or in the middle and then kind of where to put their money once they start really getting some traction i honest to god i think the best way to start any band and it really doesn't matter what genre let's say you have three thousand dollars i'd say spend two grand of it on recording a live show high quality. You might have to call in some favors. Maybe your friend has a 4K camera and knows how to use it. They'll do the whole shoot for 500 bucks or something. Believe me, if you live in a town like Austin, you'll find people who are willing to do really great work at a baller budget, right? So I'd say spend two grand on, getting, on filming a set. And the reason why I say a set is because that's like 10 different videos. You can split it up into songs. You basically are spending two grand on eight songs, right? And then, Spend a thousand on it, of it on Facebook ads or whatever platform you're popping off on. If you, if you feel like you belong better on Instagram, Sp spend it on social media ads. Work on, spend all your money on getting fans. Don't spend your money on working with some guy who said he's going to help you get fans. Just get the fans. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, the, the advantage of social media is like, because like I come from, like when we first started, it was like go to Kinko's, you know, cut your flyers up and you go out and you hand on the pe random people that you don't know that are probably just going to turn a corner and throw them out or sometimes they just throw them right down in front of your face right but on facebook and social media you can actually target specific people yeah. that will like your stuff and you wouldn't believe how far how long a thousand dollars gets you a long way you can you could do an ad for an entire month on a thousand dollars one time i put a thousand dollars into an ad and told it to end at 30 days and at the end of the 30 days it hadn't spent all the budget because enough people hadn't clicked on the ad yet. Right. So it's like you don't even have any idea how long you can make $1,000 last on, on a platform like Facebook until you try. When, when should somebody, if, if they want to like pursue it, when should they quit their day job or, or, or quit their job? When, when would you recommend that? The, the moment I knew I had to stop babysitting my sister's kids and working at the Universalist church that I was working at every other week... <laughs> The which, by the way, was a great job and got me through a lot of hard times. Shout out to Chuck Freeman. Shout out. Um, I um, I knew because I was having to cancel. I was having to like be like, oh, sorry, I can't babysit because I'm going to be going on a short tour this weekend. Oh, sorry, I can't do Free Souls because I got called to do this amazing gig with Gary. 
You know, like you just right. know because what happens is your day job or Gary whatever. Gary Clark you're... Jr., by the way. Yeah, Gary Clark Jr. Not Gary Shanling. <laughs> Gary Clark Jr. Yeah. Okay, back to the. <laughs> Thank you. Shout out. Shout out, shout Gary out, Clark shout Jr. Out, yes. Shout out. So, like, what you'll just know because your day job starts getting in the way. You start having to be like, oh, I can't go to that because I'm going to go make money here. Oh, I can't go to that because and your day job could be anything. It could be your side hustle, whatever. Once it starts getting in the way and you see it as like a nuisance that's in the way, that means you don't need that money anymore. Okay. That means you're like, oh, crap, this is stopping me from making this other money over here. And, and once that happens like two, three times in the same four or five month period, you keep on having to call off, call off. That's yeah. when you know. That's when you're like, Maybe I don't have time for this job anymore. Hmm. Right. You know? Yeah. And, you know, that's some good advice for y'all out there. Because I know a lot of people, you know, are in that position where they're trying to kind of like foot in both worlds. Mm -hmm. And I would I would suggest the same thing. You know? It's just yeah. you, you, you kind of have to, once it starts taking over. Yeah. That's when the you The other know. stuff phases itself out. And also, I feel like for me personally, was the moment when I was like, put my foot in the, in the sand in terms of like payment. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Cause like when that we, was the beginning of it. When we first started, you know, it was like we were just playing for playing for drink tickets, of course. 50 bucks, 10 percent of the bar or whatever. There's space for that. But you know, I yeah, I mean, you, you start, you know, you start and, there, and you gotta I was start there. I, I was laying concrete. I was uh, I, I was substitute teaching here. Yeah, you're like, hustling, you man. know, just doing the thing. But like yeah. once I, once I was like, nah, you know, all right, we're getting two hundred dollars a gig. Yeah. You know what I mean? Maybe and, you don't and, need to substitute anymore. And now we started, that you're getting you know, so that a gig, you know? that was like. A clear sense was like, okay, we can just drop this. Yeah, you know what I mean. So everybody, like, if you're at that point, yeah. you're 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 at the beginning of your journey. And like she said, focus on building your fan base. You don't have to go around and tour, spend a lot of money on touring because that's expensive. Yeah, can you talk about the expenses of touring real quick. <sighs> My goodness, the I expenses mean, of touring are insane. Because here's the thing: there is the guaranteed expense, and then there's the Oh yeah. no, that yes. happened. Hotel. Yeah, that's guaranteed. Right. So we're talking about per day to bring a four piece band out a day. Well, forget about that, right? That's <laughs> okay. Per day to bring me just you and, and a tour manager out. Okay. Is like if it evens out to something like five hundred dollars per a, day. A day. And that's just to live. That's to get there, to have a bed to sleep in, to have food to eat, even if you go grocery okay. store shopping. Okay, okay. So you do have food. Yes. Okay. You have food to eat and like uh, you know, just basic stuff. Just to be there, it's five hundred dollars a day. So but then, did, okay, go ahead. But then, uh, oh no, the tire just went flat. Oh, we just got the our wallet stolen. Oh, stuff happens. So it's like I'm here for five hundred dollars, and now I just have to spend like four hundred more dollars because the drummer of the previous band uh, isn't coming anymore, and now I have to go rent a drum kit. These effects. So, folks that are just getting Crazy. started. Five hundred dollars a day, put five hundred dollars into ads, target those cities that yes. you want to go to with a video. Yep. You know, spend Have whatever whatever you can. If it's not two thousand, spend whatever spend, you can. Yeah, let's say right? two thousand gets you eight songs. We'll spend five hundred and get, you know, four uh, two songs. Whatever it is, like create <laughs> something that looks decent mm -hmm. and start targeting those cities that you want to go to and then build up from there. And also, um, now, in this beautiful world we live in, this beautiful, crazy world we live in, you can live stream. So you target your Man. videos to those cities, and guess what? Start targeting your live streams to those cities as well. And your live stream game is popping. I mean, it's just, you're, <laughs> working off, on it. you're off the charts with it. <laughs> I'm working on yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, you're working at everything. I mean, <laughs> but, what, okay, if you don't mind, like, what's, what's, the, what's the biggest payday you've had on a live stream? Like, on a live stream? Yeah, like, just, yeah. Just like crazy. Yeah, I mean, just what's the biggest pay to like? You just you play guitar for like however many hours. Okay. You got hit with how much? What's the check biggest? it out? I did a three-hour Jackie the Robot DJ marathon. Uh huh. It was. It ended up being something like sixteen hundred bucks. What? It was crazy because well, I did it for three hours, and there was like four hundred people watching the whole time, and wow. sometimes it would fluctuate to seven hundred. Kurt, hit us with the tip. The tip link for her. That if, was a crazy day. If, that was like two, three months ago. If you enjoyed what that she That got me through, man. If you enjoyed what she did, let's let's I don't think we can go six sixteen hundred tonight. Oh no, but that was like special I'm super just saying, no, I'm never just saying, gotten, I haven't gotten that crazy. close yet. No, that's crazy though. I mean, I, that yeah. must have felt incredible. That was nuts. It felt really incredible, but then I was like, 
I wish it would happen again. Yeah, now, <laughs> now, now you're like a crack fiend. Yeah, now I know. You're like, like hey, it hasn't like, happened. Now you jump like, how do I get there again? Exactly. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do I get there? Exactly. Try, it's like the first high. <laughs> you try, never get back to the first high. Trying to duplicate. Like, what song did I play? Yeah, what song? What, did what I, button did I? Hit? I played for exactly two hours, two hours and, and fifty-eight half. minutes, and I'm gonna play for That's exactly. That's the trick because <laughs> the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> the algorithm is the. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Nah. <laughs> it's like that meme where it's like math equations. Right, the right. Like, it's like nah. Sometimes it just hits like sometimes that. Sometimes it just hits like that. And but honestly, up. like I don't need to make sixteen hundred dollars every day in order to fund the stuff that I'm doing. So I'm I'm just I mean, really and I'm really grateful to people whether or not they donate. I'm really yeah. grateful for everybody tuning in and everything. Just a couple more questions for you. I'm I hope some of y'all are still tuned in. Once again, it's Jackie Vincent. My name is Shaka. I'm the program director of Legacy ATX. This is Legacy Live. Question for you, what is your most proud fan moment? My proud fan your, moment? Yeah, your most proud fan moment. Something that, like, because I know we have a lot. Like, some people would just, like, stop us in the grocery store yeah. and thank us. You know, I have so many of those stories. Like, I, yeah. I screenshot the texts and the emails that we get. They never get old, yeah. Yeah, but what what's your, like, most proud, like, moment? I have two. Okay. Uh, one was a squad post. My friend Matt Barnett. Shout out to Matt. Shout out, Matt. He... He screenshotted a private conversation he was having with his friends, and they decided that dedication should be measured in, in Vincent's. <laughs> and they were like, okay. most people are only capable of a semi-Vincent, because one Vincent is just, like, way out of reach. <laughs> That's what he said. Okay, this is like Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. He's like, dedication should be measured in Vincent's. Okay. So, so that was awesome. And okay. then another um, really great moment was a fan of mine that had been to a bunch of my shows here at One to One Bar in Austin rolled into this smoky bar in Berlin, Germany, and was like, Jackie! What? I was in Berlin, Germany. And this chick rolls up and they're like, Jackie! Just like that, too, I'm sure. Like... I was like, I was in the middle of a song and I stopped. I was like playing. Hell yeah. And I was like. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I couldn't believe, I, I couldn't believe her. Last time I saw her was at one to one bar in Austin, Texas, man. Wow. Crazy. That's kind of the magic of this whole thing, right? Yeah. That's what makes it all so worthwhile it's and so, so real. Yeah. It's all connected to everything. Last question. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. Um thanks again for tuning in, everybody. Yes, thank you, everybody. This is our first of many that we're gonna be doing. Um if you wanna share with us, um, who you'd like to see next. Maybe you have an example of somebody in Austin. We have some ideas in our mind already, but um, please, you know, share with us at e4youth.org uh, or facebook.com slash e4youth. Um, this last question. All right. Legacy. Yeah. What do you want your legacy to be? Well, I used to only answer that question one way. With, uh, I, I want to have a in like an impossibly huge body of work. Like how could one human ever create that Prince, much? You're talking music? about Prince level. Yes. Maybe even beyond. Whoa. But <laughs> maybe. Whoa. I mean you, you gotta dream big. You know what I'm saying? Whoa. It's gonna be pretty hard. <laughs> Cause like Frank Zappa also has like freaking six hundred albums. Anyways, I'm working on it. So that's that's the first thing. I want to have like this crazy body. Shout out T Double. He's got like thirty. Oh yeah, T Double man, I'm coming for you, T Double. Like coming for albums. you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like uh, then recently I realized that I want to leave my city and my community better than than it was when I was alive. What does that look like? What Inclusivity. Okay. And equity in the music industry and beyond. Specifically in Austin. Specifically in Austin, yes. Because this is the city I live in, and this is the city I plan on living in for a long time. And so I want to leave things better than the way I found them. There it is, folks. We appreciate y'all tuning in. We're going to leave you with this um, short video. It's about it's a few minutes, so you can get some more knowledge and information about E4 Youth. Check it out. Please don't turn, don't tune away if you're still with us. Watch the video so you can understand about the important work that E4 Youth is doing in Austin, working with young creators and giving them the opportunity to find their path in their career in the creative fields. Thanks for tuning in, y'all. It's Legacy Live. Shout out to Jackie Vincent. Be safe. Be good to each other. We'll check you out next time.